sexual complaints seen in adolescents uh, and young adults incidence ranges from 15 to 30 percent in young active adults and it's mostly underdiagnosed it's common in females because of increased uh, pelvic width uh, high heels usage sitting with legs adducted in spite of its high incidence it's it is most neglected less known most problematic pathological knee condition of all that's why it's called black hole of orthopedics so because of poor understanding uh, the complexity of treatment increases because of which there be multi, uh, because of which there are multiple failed surgeries and there are a lot of patients who are demoralized after repeated uh, attempts of surgeries and treatment so at this juncture i would like to bring in two terms one is internal derangement of knee and other one is chondromalacia patella so both these terms are uh, actually uh, uh, coined almost 100 years before before 100 years uh, uh, after that the authors which coined these terms they themselves uh, understood that these these uh, these terms don't denote anything and they don't uh, give us any information regarding the disease so they coined these terms as waste bu waste uh, bucket terms so they said these terms should not be used in future but we are after 100 years we are these two terms are still very much relevant to our uh, clinical practice so that that actually gives us a gist about how how far we have progressed uh, in understanding the pathology of anterior uh, knee pain which means we have not uh, progressed at all we hardly progressed uh, in understanding so that's why uh, internal derangement of knee which is called idk which should be called i don't know and chondromalacia patella which is called cmp this in this 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 should be called as could be maybe or possibly be so coming to theories uh, coming to theories which uh, describes this anterior knee pain in 1970 uh, a attribute attributed to this anterior knee pain to patellofemoral malalignment so which is defined as abnormality of uh, patella tracking in the sense of lateral displacement of patella lateral tilt of patella or both in extension that reduces in flexion so which uh, in turn means malalignment of patella on femur but actually uh, few authors contradicted it and they said it's actually the other way around uh, actually it's the mal position of knee between body and foot that means the structural abnormalities of the knee which which actually give rise to mal position of patella so there was a following this theory there was sharp increase in number of surgical procedures to correct the mal alignment but then very quickly uh, after seeing uh, complications related to the surgery and uh, dissatisfaction rates the people have understood that this is not the whole reason for uh, the this is not the one, this is not the reason for anterior knee pain so very quickly uh, uh, the number of surgical number of surgeries decreased so actually a very small percentage of people will have patellofemoral mal alignment as a primary cause if you look at this uh, ct scan this is a ct scan of same patient uh, bilateral ct scan of same patient uh, who who has anterior knee pain on the right side if you look at this scan actually the, on the both sides there is patella uh, mal tracking the lateral shift of patella but the patient is symptomatic only on the right side so which which shows that whatever theory they proposed is not uh, very relevant so in my, so uh, the next theory is tissue homeostasis theory in 1990 scott dai came up with a came up with this theory according to him loss of both osseous and soft tissue uh, homeostasis in peripatellar region is the most important uh, factor in genesis of anterior knee pain and the biomechanical and structural characteristics patients are often uh, asymptomatic due to supra physiological loading of anatomically normal knee components so this is a graph you, can you see my cursor yeah so uh, this red line which you see this is called as he he coined a term called, called envelope of function which means every knee will have a envelope of function beyond which uh, pe uh, people start uh, will start getting pain so this red line is the envelope of function in a normal uh, normal patients 
so any load which falls below uh, below this is called zone of homeostasis and patient will be comfortable within this any load beyond this uh, patient will start feeling the symptoms this is a normal uh, thing in case of uh, if there is any injury or in case of uh, any structural abnormalities the uh, envelope of function actually decreases this dotted line which is there this is the envelope of function in uh, post injury or the patients who has uh, structural abnormalities so in that actually the zone of homeostasis is very low so even a minor minor injuries can give rise to uh, excessive load and people start getting pain so um, my colleague rahul will actually uh, talk about this in detail so actually both theories are not exclusive but complementary a knee with patellofemoral mal malalignment can exist happily within its envelope of function but once it is out for example by overuse training error pattern of faulty sport a patient can start getting pain so there is one more theory which is called neurological theory this theory actually came up so when uh, people started doing surgeries on malalignment they have taken samples from the lateral retinaculum and uh, they have done studies on it histological studies and all that this theory came out of those uh, findings according to according to this theory uh, because of uh, tight lateral retinaculum in ex uh, in extension when when the knee flexes there will be excessive stretch on the lateral retinaculum which causes hypoxia and because of this hypoxia in, in turn uh, leads to release of new neurological growth factor which in turn causes hyper innervation and uh, causes more free nerve endings which is the source for pain so this is the neurological theory so coming to causes for anterior knee pain uh, starting from most common causes uh, most common causes are patellofemoral pain or patellar patella tendinopathy less common ones are prepatellar bursitis infrapatellar bursitis synovial plica quadriceps tendinopathy fat pad Im impingement patellofemoral instability occasionally seen are stress factors of patella osgood status disease the ones not to be missed referred pain from hip osteochondritis desiccans scfe perthes tumor the lower limb structural abnormalities and lower limb dynamic imbalance so here is a small algorithm uh, to show how anterior knee pain can happen so if you have uh, ischemia of lateral retinaculum or osseous hypertension in the patella this can cause loss of vascular and neurological hum uh, homeostasis and if there is a decrease envelope of function or the, if there is a overuse of normal uh, knee causes a focal supraphysiological loading of anatomically normal knee both in turn causes mechanical stimulation of patellar or trochlear interosseous nerves which will lead to anterior knee pain and the other one sir if there is lack of uh, lower limb if there is lower limb lack of dynamic control or lower limb structural abnormalities these things can cause patellofemoral imbalance this in turn can cause uh, retinacular overload instability and pain or it can cause osseous or cartilage overload chondropathy or osteoarthritis and pain so coming to uh, clinical history what to ask uh, how to how to approach a patient normally uh, you should ask about any underlying uh, supraphysiological loading event or a series of events that led to development of symptoms certain activities of daily living associated with pf loads which are uh, getting up from chair getting up and down the stairs uh, sitting for a long time they can become symptomatic the characteristics of pain we should ask is quality of pain is there any radiation uh, are there any exacerbating and relieving factors anterior knee pain is frequently reported by patients to be achy poorly localized positional and activity related commonly present with symptoms that are vague chronic in duration bilateral sometimes and insidious in onset the pain usually increases with activity and decreases with rest pain is rarely constant and asymptomatic periods are common usually pain is worse while climbing up and down the stairs the movie theater sign which is uh, pain when if you notice pain after a prolonged sitting this is because of Uh, stretch in the extensor mechanism and uh, lateral and posterior directed forces on the 
రెడ్ నెక్లో పట్లా రెడ్ నెక్లో నెక్స్ట్ ఈజ్ కమింగ్ టు లొకేషన్ ఆఫ్ ద పెయిన్ కెన్ బి వేక్లీ యాంటీరియర్ ఇట్ కెన్ బి మీడియల్ ఆర్ లేటల్ టు ద పటెలా అండ్ మీడియల్ ఆర్ లేటల్ జాయింట్ లైన్ దిస్ మీడియల్ ఆర్ లేటల్ జాయింట్ లైన్ టెండర్నెస్ ఇట్ కెన్ బి బికాస్ ఆఫ్ మెనిస్కల్ పెథాలజీ ద పెయిన్ కెన్ బి ఈవెన్ ఇన్ ద పాపులిటియల్ ఫోర్సా బికాస్ ఆఫ్ ద బికాస్ ఆఫ్ హ్యామ్స్ట్రింగ్ టైట్నెస్ ఆర్ పీసీఎల్ ఇంజురీస్ ఇఫ్ ద పెయిన్ ఈస్ ప్రెసెంట్ ఇన్ ద ఇన్ఫీరియర్ పోల్ ఆఫ్ పటెలా ఇట్ యూజువలీ ఈస్ డ్యూ టు టెండినైటీస్ ఆఫ్ ద పటెలా టెండన్ ఆర్ ఫ్యాట్ ఫ్యాట్ ఇంపెంచ్మెంట్ so pain that is constant and are not related to activity or knee position should make the clinician suspicious of referred pain neurological pain reflex sympathetic dystrophy or magnification for secondary gain rarely pain at rest can be associated with tumor infection or stress fracture some patients will complain of knee swelling and warmth which can be subjective i think this is what we hear most of the times uh, if a patient when a patient comes to us with any knee pain noisy knees usually are uh, not very problematic until unless they start showing some symptoms special attention must be taken to associated psychiatric pathologies or psycho psychological conflicts should ask any if there is any history of patellar instability and uh, should ask if they have taken any tre- uh, previous treatments the uh, previous treatments can be bracing taping and sides uh, injection therapy physical therapy any surgeries the family history coming to examination so the origin of patellar uh, patellar femoral symptoms is generally multifactorial and clinical examination cannot be limited to knee but must be must take patient as a whole so you should examine the patient as a whole so going sequentially first you should examine the patient in standing position first is bipodal stance that is uh, standing on both legs first in from front one can appreciate the varus valgus alignment of the knee orientation of uh, patella morphology of uh, forefoot from side uh, one can see uh, inclination of pelvis spinal curvatures particularly of lumbar hyperlordosis recurvatum of or flexum of the knees from behind one can appreciate the existence of scoliosis tilted pelvis mal rotation of leg leg length discrepancy varus or valgus varus or valgus alignment of talus and an abduction or adduction of the forefoot so one leg stance this is very important uh, when you are uh, examining uh, knee for anterior knee pain uh, this position makes it possible to appreciate appreciate equi- equilibrium of the lower limb a lack of balance is frequently associated with uh, femoropatellar symptoms such as pain with or with or without instability and secondary uh, diffuse muscular weakness in case of lack of balance one could observe deficient hip abductors a tendency to kneel in a medial collapse in valgus hyperpronation of hyperpronation at the foot and compensatory inclination of the upper body sorry when the patient is asked to bend the knee on which he is standing the deficiencies tend to deficiencies tend to worsen so uh, this is an image where uh, and a person, person this is how you should examine uh, single leg stance this is a uh, this is an image depicting normal uh, balance in this image you can see there is uh, you can see the pelvis getting tilted to the opposite side which means the abductors are deficient so this uh, this in this image you can actually see when you ask the patient to bend 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 his knee it's going into further valgus so gait analysis while having the patient walk we can observe him from front and from back look at the symmetry of his gait the way he balances his arm the length of the stride the orientation of patella varus valgus alignment of extremity the intensity of heel strike the step angle the pelvic tilt coming to seated position look for any swellings or uh, muscle atrophy in sitting position you uh, measure something called as a tubercle sulcus angle this is an equivalent to q angle measured this is an equivalent to q angle which is measured at 90 degrees flexion how it is measured you draw a uh, line you draw a transepicondylar axis 
and draw a perpendicular line which is which passing through the inferior pole of patella that is the reference line the second the second line is from tip, uh, center of tibial tuberosity to the inferior pole of patella the, the angle the angle between two is called as tubercle sulcus angle so it's no, it should normally be 0 degree if it is more than 10 degree it means that uh, there is excessive lateralization of tibial tuberosity patella tracking is evaluated by asking uh, the patient to flex and extend the knee while sitting in the presence of instability one can see the patella centered on the trochlea in flexion and lateral subluxation near full extension this lateral shift consists constitutes the so called j sign in supine position we look for uh, spontaneous position of the limb and the q angle is measured in prone position femoral antiversion can be measured by measuring internal and external rotation of hip with knee in uh, 90 degree flexion external tibial torsion is up, obtained by maintaining the angle between bimalleolar plane and the longitudinal axis of the femur this is a image depicting how you should measure the external tibial torsion knee effusion uh, is checked by doing a patella tap test okay. uh, coming to palpation all the anatomical structures of knee are palpated to detect painful trigger points inflammation or uh, structural defects coming to palpation of patella tendon uh, how how it is done you actually uh, stabilize the patella is stabilized laterally and pushed distally against the thumb in case of patella tendonitis the uh, you, this test will be positive the next is pelvic glide test uh, this is to see the mobility of uh, uh, patella in medial lateral plane normally you make uh, you draw uh, five quadrants on the knee and if you push the patella laterally it should cross at least beyond uh, two quadrants if it is less than one if it is uh, if there if it is if there is no movement or if the movement is less than one quadrant the test is positive so another one is the patella tilt test so these two tests actually uh, de uh, detect lateral retinacular tightness coming to uh, another sign which is called as engagement sign on occasion there can be a con uh, conflict as the patella engages into proximal tro trochlea a short trochlea patella alta knee recurvatum all are the factors that are predisposed to problematic patella engagement and hence a source of pain how it is done you patient is in supine position knee in full extension the thumb is applied firmly on the inferior uh, tip of the patella and the knee is and the, you ask the patient to flex the knee till 20 degrees the test is positive if the contact between patella and trochlea is painful comprehension test uh, it's called fairbank sign it's a patho pathognomic uh, sign of patellofemoral instability the patient is instructed to extend the knee uh, starting at 20 to 30 degrees of flexion with the examiner uh, pushes the patella laterally the test is positive when patient resists and recognizes instability symptoms muscle uh, flexibility patellofemoral pain syndrome has been frequently associated with defic deficits of uh, lower limb flexibility and several retrospective studies have shown this relationship in athletes there have been consistent results showing this association with the tight quadriceps other muscle groups which you have to check for flexibility is our hamstring it band iliopsoas and gastrocnemius gastrocnemius coming to investigations uh, first first invest investigation is x ray ap view the ap uh, It has to be done in a monopodal stance every time. That means single leg stance. Until 50 year old, this should be done in 15 to 20 degrees of flexion, and after that, it should be done in 30 to 45 degrees of flexion, which is called Rosenberg view. See uh, the images which you can see here. The left side on your screen is an image which is taken at uh, 20 degrees of flexion, which was decent amount of medial joint line. Uh, joint uh, space the image on the right side is actually taken at uh, 45 degrees flexion which shows complete bone on bone disease so why it is important is uh, because whenever we uh, whenever we walk normally our stance phase is at about 30 degrees of knee flexion 
so the cart cartilage degeneration starts in that area so that's the reason you have to get a knee x-ray in flexion preferably at 30 to 45 degrees flexion so other things to look at um, in ap view is quality of bones is are there any calcifications uh, loose bodies fractures lateral view this is the most interesting view of the knee the reliability of the interpretation depends on the technical quality of the radiologist it is absolutely essential to have a perfect superimposition of two posterior condyles. The X-ray is done in monopodal weight bearing, that means single leg weight bearing, with an angle of 15 to 20 degrees knee flexion. Things to look at: so joint line thickness, especially coming to joint line thickness, we have to see uh, which uh, part of the tibial cartilage is actually worn out. This indirectly indicates the indirectly indicates ACL, ACL deficiency. If the Cartilage is deficient more towards the posterior side. That means there is a chronic uh, ACL deficiency. And you should look for anterior or posterior tibial translation. Trochlea, you have this. Um, this is a very important thing to look at in lateral view. Normally, the sulcus line uh, follows the Blumenzett line. In a normally, this line stays posterior to the condylar line, meaning that trochlea is deep and congruent. What does that mean? If you actually look at the X-ray on on your right, you can see the Blumenzett line, and uh, which actually continues anteriorly as a sulcus line, like this. And it should be, and it, if you can see my cursor, it this line should be posterior to the condylar line. That means the trochlea is deep enough. Henry described in 19, 1987 the crossing sign, which characterizes trochlear dysplasia, dysplasia on sagittal view. In case of uh, trochlear dysplasia, there will be a crossing sign between the sulcus line and lateral condyle, meaning the trochlea, trochlea is flat. If you can see these images, the one on the extreme left, it's, it's, it's a normal trochlea. If you can see the Blumenzett line uh, continuing as sulcus line, which is well posterior to the condylar line, that means the trochlea is deep. So, in case of a flat trochlea, this sulcus line actually uh, will be at the same level as the condylar line. In case of convex trochlea, the sulcus line is actually anterior to the condylar line. So coming to patella height, uh, the most common index which we use is insult salivary ratio. It is a ratio between uh, length of patella and the longest sagittal diameter of the patella normally uh, normally it is about one, uh, one a ratio a ratio smaller than 0.8 indicates uh, patella baha a ratio greater than 1.2 indicates patella alta coming to axial view uh, what you have to look at in axial view is uh, sulcus angle the angle this is an angle uh, formed by two lines connecting the deepest point of trochlear group to the highest points of medial and lateral femoral condyles. This measurement evaluates the shape of the groove. The greater the sulcus angle, the flatter the trochlea. The average sulcus angle on the merchant view is 138. It's more or less equal in males and females. Coming to patella shape, Weberg classified them into three types. Type 1, the medial and lateral facets are both concave and closely equivalent in size. Type 2, the medial facet is smaller than the lateral facet and has a flat or concave surface. The lateral facet has a concave uh, contour. Type, in type 3, the medial facet is very small, nearly inexistent, describing at a right angle in relation to the lateral facet. The most frequent type of patella in, in objective patella dislocation is Weber type 2. And case, in cases of high grade patella femoral dysplasia, it will be type 3. In uh, actual view, you have to look at biparitate or multiparitate patella. They are they are result of incomplete fusion of the ossification center. Last but not least, what you have to look at in actual view is the patella femoral arthritis. Coming to CT scans, in CT scan, the most important thing to look at is a tibial tubercle trochlear groove distance. This is nothing but a, a sitting a measurement of a uh, sitting Q angle. But, but a more uh, objective thing. The two specific cuts are necessary. The first is one through proximal trochlea. 
it is called the reference cut the second cut is the one which goes through proximal part of tibial tubercle these two cuts are then superimposed on each other the deepest point of trochlear groove and central point of tibial tubercle are projected on a line tangential tangential to the projected condyles this is sound you can see my cursor these are the two cuts which are superimposed on each other uh, the first cut is on the trochlea the second cut is at the proximal most uh, point of tibial tuberosity and you measure you measure a distance between this uh, deepest point of the trochlea groove to the center of tibial tuberosity normally this is uh, about 12 mm if it is more than uh, 20 mm it is more and uh, it is usually seen in cases of patellar dislocations other things which can be measured on ct scan are femoral antiversion tibial torsion torsion last but not but not the least mri uh, scan should be done to look at articular uh, cartilage and other so soft tissue lesions of the knee joint so coming to treatment aspect i'm not going into detail about the treatment aspect the main stay of treatment in case of anterior knee pain is conservative uh, which can be nsaids uh, injections activity modification and physiotherapy surgeries which are indicate surgeries are actually indicated in uh, very uh, rare cases which is almost less than 5% of the cases few of the surgeries which are described are arthroscopic cartilage debridement uh, arthroscopic lateral retinacular release proprioplasty uh, medial tubercle transfer proximal quadriceps plasty and mpfl re reconstruction okay take home points so anterior knee pain is a complex entity examination as a whole is important do not examine just the knee joint surgeries are required in very very few patients findings or investigations may not be a cause of pain in most of the times so whenever you investigate a patient with anterior knee pain and you find some findings on x ray or mri don't just jump into it and do something for it most of the times they are they are just incidental findings and they may not be the cause for uh, uh, the and knee pain most of the patients do well with good physiotherapy thank you any doubts and wish hi vivek yeah so the x rays that you spoke about are they uh, 45 degree 40 degrees of flexion and all yes. so are those weight bearing x rays or non weight weight, weight bearing x rays single leg standing okay single leg standing single leg standing in 45 degree flexion called rosenberg view yeah yeah so normally why it happens uh, why you have to get it in 40 approximately 30 to 40 degree flexion is normally whenever we are walking our stance phase is normally at about 30 degrees of knee flexion normally whenever we are walking we don't extend our knee completely so normally a ma major loading happens at 30 to 40 degrees of flexion so that's why the degeneration changes in that area so that's the reason we have to get it in that uh, 30 to 40 degrees of flexion yeah okay so so that is like a general x ray view for all the knee pains or is it uh, specific to anterior knee especially in young patient you don't have to go all the way till 45 degree uh, 15 to 20 degrees of knee flexion should be okay in younger patient uh, but whenever you are actually dealing with the uh, world uh, for your patients it's better to get it in 45 degrees flexion so my my point being uh, a, in case you have a condyle defect or osteochondral defect in the uh, lower aspect or the posterior aspect of the condyles which is evident in a 40 degree uh, stress view weight yes. bearing view yes. so is, is that one of the reasons uh, for an anterior knee pain so should we make it like a mandate to make uh, this view uh, uh, specific for anterior knee pains or should it be make it for every knee pain like i think, I think, I think it makes, yeah i think it makes sense to get this view in flexion for all the knee pains for all the knee pains yeah. yes yeah anything else what is the role of mr cartogram 
should we do we, we should we get mr cartogram or like a standard mri will be sufficient see normally mr cartogram and all i don't think we pre uh, prescribe it regularly i think regularly we should get a routine mri if you are not finding anything and if you are actually looking for uh, something after uh, all the investigation then it, maybe it makes sense to get an mr program sorry chondrogram not regularly the problem is see even if you have a chondromalacia patella so most of the times they were uh, they couldn't relate the pain to that i mean they couldn't locate a locate the pain to the chondral defects hmm. but in in a few uh, anterior knee pain young patients with anterior knee pain uh, which is associated with uh, sitting cross leg or deep squats or uh, using indian toilets but yeah. when you go arthroscopically and view them they have mm -hmm. they actually have a damaged under surface of patella correct you they might see most of the times they are just incidental findings they might not be the actual reason for pain okay. so actually this uh, guy called scott day he did an experiment on himself so he uh, he actually did an arthroscopic uh, probing of his knee while he was away and he uh, mapped those uh, painful points actually under surface of patella is not that sensitive according to him okay so they couldn't actually point uh, knee pain to that chondral lesions even though they might be there so in that case in most of the arthritis more than the uh, chondral uh, defect the pain is due to synovitis yeah it is because of synovitis and uh, retinacular tightness yeah mostly that's how it is yeah yeah i think rahul over to you we can't hear you yeah yes uh, so audible? Audible? yes yes you are audible all right i'll quickly share my presentation Okay, uh, welcome everybody. First of all, thank you for joining us on this Saturday evening uh, session, academic session on uh, uh, kneecap related pains. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anvesh. That was a very lucid presentation that you've given. So, my topic, just a second, I'm quickly scrolling through my screen. All right, so I'll be speaking about uh, allied kneecap pains and chondro malicia patla on the rehab aspect mostly. So the first image actually indicates a classical symptom that uh, patients usually complain of when they're getting up from the chair or during, uh, you know, there is a cracking sound in the knee that they usually hear. Okay, so more than giving it, coining it as chondro malicia patla, I think the, it's an umbrella term, patlofemoral pain syndrome. It encompasses many things that we usually uh, the medical literature speaks of. So one of them is chondromalacia patella, definitely. Jumper's knee, that means pain felt on the uh, patella tendon typically. Runner's knee, the kneecap pain. Retropatellar pain, lateral knee pain, peripatellar pain, pain around the kneecap. So these usually encompass what is called as a patellofemoral pain syndrome. Now, usually the whole diagnosis and the rehabilitation part, the whole treatment part is area specific, right? It is area specific and the treatment part is also area specific. So depending on where exactly the pain is coming from, from the, for that particular patient on the knee, uh, we tend to make our diagnosis accordingly. So on the lateral side, typically if it is uh, more on the lateral side of the kneecap, there uh, you know, it's uh, iliotibial band syndrome, quad tendinopathy. On the medial side, yes, chondromalacia patella symptoms can be com coming from that side. Uh, Pessans, Ryan, bursitis. Pain syndrome or one of them. Chondromalacia patella is more of a, the, you know, it's a boiled down diagnosis. That means first, our diagnosis should arrive after we have ruled out everything. Uh, you know, any classic grade one uh, meniscal lesions also can sometimes uh, give rise to pains like these. So rule that out. 
rule out any uh, lateral structure involvement like ITBS, iliotibial band syndrome, any patella tendonitis. So all area specific diagnosis we usually rule out and then our final boil down diagnosis should be patellofemoral pain syndrome. So usually patellofemoral joint loads, they are a cumulative of both extrinsic and intrinsic loads. So both of them, what are these extrinsic and intrinsic loads? Eccentric loads are usually those loads that come from outside the body. So uh, typically you know, the ground reaction force, uh, the body mass, if there is an increased body mass, there is more uh, ground reaction force accumulation on the knee, on the kneecap part particularly. Uh, speed of movement, right, surfaces on which they walk and any change of footwear, all these factors usually contribute to the extrinsic factors of uh, patellofemoral joint. Any, and intrinsic factors, those are usually divided into remote and local factors. Remote factors are the, you know, the uh, any change in the arthrokinematics of the knee joint, like increased femoral internal rotation, dynamic knee valgus, that means the knee valgus that is presented usually during gait, tibial rotations, uh, typically the external rotation of tibia, subtalar pronation, any, uh, uh, any, in, any change in the ankle uh, biomechanics also usually tends to contribute to the patellofemoral knee joint symptoms. And certain local factors like patella position, whether it is a high riding patella, low riding patella, squint tight patella, uh, soft tissue tension and neuromuscular control of the medial and lats lateral components of the vastus medialis. So, Usually, it is the patella is maintained by a dynamic, uh, uh, like an equilibrium of the lateral and medial structures, the both the muscles, the retinaculum, and the other soft tissues that usually maintain the normal biomechanics of them. So, patellofemoral uh, pain syndrome it's better understood by envelope of function model that was proposed by Scott Dye, he's an orthopedic surgeon. Uh, so, what he usually says is so if you can see the blue. The zone of homeostasis is all the typical activities that the patient can usually tolerate. Like it can be for, it's individual specific of course, like let's say a patient can walk 10 kilometers per day and he has, and he's comfortable. Uh, he can climb four uh, staircases very easily, running three kilometers a day. Adapted tolerance to exercise activities, that means he has a certain tolerance and he does all his activities within those exercise tolerance. But, uh, and there is something called a zona supraphysiological load. That means his tissues and his knee joint per se, it can take a threshold of this. Like let's say his earlier his walking was 10 kilometers a day. Now any gradual change in this activity, like 15 kilometers per day, or let's say he started running more in a sudden fashion. Skipping stairs, normally he, that particular patient, he just normally goes by individually stairs, but he starts skipping stairs. Sudden increase in resistance loads, that means any sudden change in the bout of the exercise. So with these activities that we see in the gray area of here, they are usually the zona supraphysiological load. That means till this uh, activity level, that particular organism can tolerate. What happens now, what usually happens is most uh, these uh, kneecap pain, patellofemoral pain syndrome uh, symptoms, they happen because of any sudden change in activity of that particular patient. And when that happens, usually, patient complaints of pain. That means any sudden change in uh, his, uh, you know, his zone of homeostasis, his envelope of function is usually within the supraphysiological load. So any sudden change that he usually uh, does, so that leads to a structural failure and uh, nociception can arise from them. So this is just to illustrate furthermore, like let's say this is a same, a normal patient. He normally manages to about uh, jump for two meters height, run for one hour, that's all okay. Excessive also, he uh, you know jumps for more than three meters height, running on hills for 30 minutes. Now any sudden change he does, what happens is what was earlier tolerable for that patient now becomes excessive for him. Now what he was doing earlier, even jumping from two meters becomes painful. Running on hills for more than 30, 30 minutes even, that becomes painful. So what was normal earlier, clinically, now that becomes painful. So this is the... Uh, Envelope of function. So most any rehabilitation uh, plan that we have for the patient should actually be in such a way that slowly, slowly we are pushing the patient to increase his zone of function. Whatever is within his uh, envelope of function that we are introducing more and more activities into it. 
So a little, I'll be touching upon the patellofemoral joint uh, biomechanics. So on the left side, if you see, this is an image of the uh, knee going into flexion. And these red and green image, green linings that you see on the knee is usually, it's indicative that uh, the greater the knee flexion, the more there is the patellofemoral joint stresses. Right? If you see on uh, 0 degrees to 30 degrees to 60 degrees gradually, uh, 0 to 30 degrees is where there is little patellofemoral joint stress. Whereas when the patient goes from beyond 60 degrees, 60 degrees to his final 140 degrees of knee flexion, this is where there is more uh, patellofemoral joint stresses. So uh, to talk a little bit about the patellofemoral joint mechanics, biomechanics is the patella usually glides superiorly and inferiorly on the femur during extension and flexion of the knee. So the total exertion of the patella from full knee extension to full knee flexion is about 5 to 7 centimeters area. So limited superior gliding of the patella may result in limited active knee extension. Uh, and also there is the initial contact between in the inferior aspect of the patella and the trochlea occurs at approximately 20 degrees of flexion. So this contact area moves proximal as the knee uh, flexes beyond 90 degrees of flexion. And the superior portion of patella contacts, comes in contact with the trochlea. So anything beyond 90 degrees of uh, uh, knee flexion, the patella rides down in the intercondylar part. So that is usually the way uh, the kneecap moves per se on the knee joint. So at uh, the odd facet of the patella makes contact with the medial uh, femoral condyle, right? And the, so now in this aspect, depending on where the condyle lesion is uh, for that particular he can usually complain of pain. So if uh, if the area of condolation is usually somewhere on the initial uh, 30 degrees, so if, that, if it is on that part of the patella, he will have pain during that aspect of uh, knee flexion. So that is how it usually presents. That is a typical uh, joint biomechanics of the patellofemoral joint. And it is obviously always maintained by lateral and medial restraints. So clinical characteristics are uh, uh, you know, we usually see reduced quad bulk and primarily it is noticed on the VMO. So when we compare it to the contralateral uh, limb, the contralateral knee, the significantly the VMO atrophies uh, and that uh, the timing of VMO measured on surface EMG. What are, so if to look at it, uh, to probe a little more deeper into it, if we uh, usually apply a surface EMG on the knee joint, on the VMO, and if you apply it even on the contralateral uh, a limb. So what we observe is the timing in which the VMO recruits. That is even an uphill running for or any change of terrain for athletes like runners. Right. So now we look at a few intrinsic factors that we were talking about. Uh, one of them, yes, definitely the muscle weakness. So usually what we see is in patellofemoral pain syndrome uh, symptoms, uh, patients, the hip uh, abductors, the knee, uh, sorry, the hip uh, lateral rotators and the knee extensors. So these three muscles usually typically go into weakness. Now, what is our objective measure to say that these muscles have gone into weakness? If we talk about MMT, a muscle man, a manual muscle test, that is not reliable because uh, if you see, if, if you ask uh, any clinician to do an MMT for the same patient, now four to five different uh, clinicians will have different different uh, uh, perception of what that particular patient strength is. So MMT is not reliable. So we need a more objective data. So that objective data can be provided by a handheld dynamometer. Now, if you see in this third picture over here, this person is handling a handheld dynamometer. This should typically be used in a physiotherapy clinical setting. So what that does is when you apply it to a particular part of the limb and you ask that patient to do a muscle contraction, now we get a reading on this dynamometer depending on how much force he exerts. So we get that kind of uh, force reading on the dynamometer. So what we usually see is that uh, the, uh, when we compare it to the contralateral limb, the hip abductors, the hip lateral rotators and the knee extensors, these three muscles usually go into weakness. So it will make sense to progressively strengthen these muscles, which will give rise to a good prognosis. 
uh, one more thing is femur femoral internal rotation now femoral internal rotation when we talk about this it is not the typical uh, the anomaly the antiversion that we usually talk about this is not that this is more of a biomechanical fault the femoral internal rotation so what uh, usually happens is during stance phase of the gait or during stance phase of running there there is because of like earlier uh, my colleague dr anvish was saying there is uh, weakness of the hip abductor so what happens is because the force which is supposed to be traveled up to the hip abductors if they the hip abductors are weak what happens is the knee typically goes into valgus this in turn creates a internal rotation effect on the femur which in turn in, uh, you know it increases the patellar femoral joint contact right so right one more thing is the increased q angle so increased q angle in turn it increases knee valgus in turn it increases uh, the patellar femoral joint stresses q angle often uh, it's exaggerated during gait mostly associated with uh, mid stance valgus thrust so in this uh, uh, with regards to this a step down test usually is a, a clinical uh, measure for us to see if a patient has uh, you know patellar femoral joint uh, uh, pain symptom so usually when we ask a patient to step down from a step uh, he complains of pain step down uh, step down test is one of them single leg squats associated with increase in knee valgus position so usually this manifests as a increased hip abduction or a lateral pelvic drop owing to weakness of the gluteus medius so this increase in q angle can be assessed radiologically and also uh, during a step down descent test like that one more uh, intrinsic factor is uh, the increased tibial rotation now this is also not an anomaly that we're talking about usually any tightness in the iliotibial band uh, 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 tissue what happens is if this is one test we can do in a clinical setting so we can ask the patient to just sit in a high sitting position if there is a single side weakness uh, of the it band so what am because the it band inserts on the lateral aspect of the tibia if the pull is a, if their it band is in a hypertoned state what happens it in turn causes the tibia to externally rotate well, and we can see you don't need to do any touching for that patient the patient can just be asked to sit and the uh, the, the feet per se goes into an external rotation the tibia goes into an external rotation the next uh, uh, intrinsic factor is the patellar position so determines uh, so whether what is the position of that patella is it a high riding patella patella alta baja or it's a normal patella is it's a squinted squinting patella or it's a frog eyed patella so depending on the patellar position also that particular uh, respective uh, soft tissue structures go into tightness or they go into weakness and they can cause a patho uh, pathomechanical abnormality which can in turn give rise to a patellofemoral pain syndrome symptoms right and uh, the next one because we talked about the ankle any change in the ankle mechanics also usually tends to give rise to increased patellofemoral joint symptom so increased subtalar pronation uh this is both pronounced like one uh, uh, just like my colleague was talking about the single leg test so in this uh, increased subtalar pronation this cannot be seen when the patient is standing on both his legs so he has to be asked to lift the contralateral leg so because of uh, decreased dynamic uh, stability of the muscles what happens is the knee typically goes into a pronation and uh, you know this causes when the knee goes into pronation uh, what happens is the knee also uh, sorry the ankle goes into pronation the knee also collapses into a valgus and what happens is the ground reaction force that usually goes midline to the knee joint it crosses even more medially and there is more uh, patellofemoral joint stresses during that area so these are some of the intrinsic factors now what are the extrinsic factors extrinsic factors are those which are acting from outside the uh, the body they are not typically your muscular forces so extrinsic factors any change in the their usual running cadence any change in the walking surface or running terrain any change in the type of footwear that can influence the mechanics of uh, gait sudden increase in body mass speed of gait also that also is you know typically that gives rise to more uh, uh, patellar femoral joint symptoms and running cadence and running gait also that means the number of steps that he takes per minute so any change in that also usually tends to translate into an increased patellar femoral joint symptoms
So these are the extrinsic and intrinsic, intrinsic factors. Uh, now, how should we go about addressing the patient? So this should be our treatment paradigm. Usually, if so, our first priority should be to reduce pain. You know, how can we reduce pain? Reducing pain can only be happen when we work on the intrinsic factors. Now, one, uh, but most of the intrinsic factors when we tend to work on, they are very good on the acute stages. So some of them are taping, electrotherapy, soft tissue work. So usually they are uh, they have good acute results. The next uh, important thing would be to modify the current envelope of function of that patient. Uh, you know, we have to this. That means his load management has to be modified. Uh, this can happen through counseling that patient, getting an understanding of how his current uh, level of activity is, and active, modifying that gait upper, uh, activity level accordingly. Any gait correction. So this should be the. Uh, this is how we modify the current envelope of function of that patient. And our next and most important thing is to build that particular patient's uh, uh, muscle strength and his ability to, to deal with all these dynamical loads in a progressive fashion. So progressive strengthening exercises gradually and returning that patient to sports or returning to his, to his level of performance. So now we'll individually look at uh, some of these uh, treatment paradigms. So the first thing is taping. So can you see your taping? There are many types of taping that uh, usually the literature uh, prescribes of canister taping and uh, there is also the McConnell or rigid taping. So there are many types of taping and depending on how the patellar position is, this canister tape has to be applied accordingly. So some of the very good effects that we see uh, for patients is their immediate effects of uh, on pain uh, symptoms reduction. The, pain, uh, the taping also is known to offload the patellofemoral joint uh, forces. And it is, but this cannot be done on a chronic run. On only on acute settings, it tends to work nicely. So only on acute settings, this taping should be done. So the classic debate: What is the best thing to be done? Is it a McConnell taping or a canister taping? McConnell taping is our typical rigid taping that we do for our patients. So uh, both provide good nociceptive input, but the only thing is with McConnell taping it. Uh, Mechanical taping tends to correct the alignment of the knee. So if there is more lateral gliding, mechanical taping uh, can actually correct the, the patellar uh, abnormality. So this was a study that was done. They saw 11 articles which were included in this analysis. Uh, so this study actually came up with the fact that uh, canister taping, it provides good nociceptive input, but it does not cause any uh, uh, mechanical alignment uh, changes, whereas a mechanical Taping typically causes mechanical uh, changes in the knee, in knee cap. Uh, next thing, soft tissue release of the iliotibial band. Because the IT band typically goes into tightness, the, which we can uh, typically see. Uh, so soft tissue release of the IT band usually reduces the, uh, the nociceptive input of that patient. But the exact uh, mechanism of effect of how this pain reduces when we do an IT band release for that patient is not known. Uh, so when the patients typically ask, I tell them, uh, how did the pain instantly reduce after you did a release or after you uh, uh, gave a good uh, uh, a painful uh, rub on the IT band. So I usually tell them that if I play a song uh, you don't like and I play it at, play it at volume 10 and then I play it uh, and if you say you don't like the song and I increase the volume to 15, then next I will reduce the song again back to 10 for after 5 to 10 minutes. So next, uh, when I reduce it back to 10, he can tolerate the song more better. So I think that, that this is one typical way we can explain it. Uh, and yes, if patients are able to perform strengthening uh, exercises immediately without uh, tape or immediately after uh, uh, immediately after putting the tape or immediately after doing an IT band release, that should be our correct gauging of whether these treatments have worked or not. So in the acute setting, whatever we do, immediately we have to test the patients and see if their pain has come down. If their pain has come down, that means we can further continue uh, with this line of action for that particular patient. Electrotherapy. So many modalities that we typically use, TENS, uh, ultrasound, extracorporeal, uh, shockwave therapy, they provide good acute relief, but on a long term basis, they do not have uh, good prognosis. So an acute uh, setting like between uh, three to four weeks when the patient uh, comes for the re uh, for, for the physiotherapy clinic, when we do uh, electrotherapy, it tends to benefit. Like that. 
and muscle more than uh, the tense uh, ultrasound and uh, shock wave muscle stimulations are known to have better short term effects when applied on vmo other intrinsic factors so correcting foot position mechanics along uh, alongside which improves muscular tenderness compliance for foot orthosis gait modification that means if like we earlier talked earlier talked about if the uh, uh, the the ankle is going into more pronation so it makes sense to use a lateral wedge a medial wedge sorry such that the joint mechanics are corrected and in turn the knee cap force is reduced exercise therapy by muscle strengthening of the quads hip abductors and external rotators so our uh, exercise therapy should be a mix of closed kinetic chain and open kinetic chain exercises so we'll just uh, quickly look at uh, some of the patellofemoral joint loads during various activities so and depending on this we have to structure a rehabilitation program so usually walking presence with uh, half of the body weight is going through the patellofemoral joint uh, stationary cycling on a stationary bike without added resistance the knee cap Uh, load is about 1.5 times the body weight. Ascending and descending stairs, the knee cap load increases to three to four times body weight. Running, the knee cap loads are about four to seven times body weight. Squatting, seven to eight times, and jumping is the highest, 20 to uh, 20 times the body weight. The knee cap uh, ex experiences forces. So, what are some of the exercise therapy uh, strategies that we can use? so depending on our, our, our understanding of joint biomechanics when we do an open chain exercise the open chain exercise is not more than 20 to 0 degrees of excess without any added resistance and when we doing it in a more longer limb setting the knee extension whether we do it in a resistance mode or we do it without resistance it has to be kept between 90 to 40 degrees of flexion because beyond 40 like we have had early earlier seen what happens is the knee cap uh, contact forces increase so this can typically be again progressed little by little to uh, standing and some uh, some of the exercises like this isometrics clamp shells to strengthen the hip external rotators and some mid phase exercise therapy approach can be we can introduce squats but not totally initially in we introduce from 0 to 30 and gradually progress from the those on here there are and uh, squatting with weights late stage exercise approach should be single leg squatting like a single leg get up and step down squats squats with weights kettlebells barbells so this should be our uh, late stage exercise that we approach so this is a uh, little bit on the patellofemoral joint uh, rehabilitation so but uh, see it's not like it's not uh, so clear like uh, it's not like a cookbook rule that we have a patient that we do uh, uh, you know only these uh, particular strategies it should be a mix of everything so our rehabilitation uh, perspective should be a mix of uh, everything it should be a mix of taping yeah, addressing the intrinsic factors addressing the extrinsic factors uh, through uh, strengthening and uh, counseling the patient to modify his activity so and the zones of failure for that particular patient for uh, for patellofemoral joint syndrome varies from one patient to the other it's like a pandora's box once we start addressing uh, in terms of rehabilitation settings so there are many asymptomatic outliers exhibiting the above explained biomechanical abnormalities that means that we can have a number of patients who demonstrate the uh, 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 typical it band tightness but they can't have any pain so structural abnormality does not necessarily correlate to a clinical complaint and these objective parameters should be taken into consideration uh, and compared to contralateral side and worked upon individually one by one all right so that is uh, the end of my presentation so any questions any discussions we can take it up over here this quickly stop All right. So, any questions? Any questions? Discussions? Any anything to ask? Okay. So, we'll end the webinar over here.
so this is the last and final uh, part of this particular webinar that we did on uh, the knee painful knee so thank you everybody who has joined us for for the first second and even the third webinar it was uh, very nice hosting uh, though you could could have spent your time doing much better things thank you for joining us for this academic session so if on further interest we'll continue doing more of this so thank you everyone and have a good day we'll end the presentation over